This is the Bad Batch that we deserve. We need more of this. Let's get into it. Yo, what's going on, everybody? It's Matt from the Circle Club. It's been a while, but I'm glad to be back. Got some really exciting content planned for you guys to start the year, but let's just get right into the Bad Batch episode three, because you're all probably wondering, the Circle Club Star Wars expert, why didn't you talk about the first and second episode? And I can explain. Before you guys start questioning, I did record a review for episode one and two. The thing is, is that most of it amounted to this. Is the Bad Batch really necessary? It just feels like filler. Like, what is the point behind this show? It's clear to see that I really didn't like the first two episodes, and I found that my review was incredibly negative, and when thinking of the first video I wanted to put out in 2023, that's not really the vibe I was going for. And with my opinions on the first two episodes, and my overall thoughts on the first season as a whole, I really wasn't all that excited and enthusiastic about coming into this episode. But boy was I wrong, because episode 3 of The Bad Batch is the best episode of Bad Batch that they have made to date. And I will die on that hill. My long running issue with the show is that they have us in the most interesting time period within the Star Wars timeline. The fall of the Republic and the Jedi Order transitioning into the rise of the Empire. And in my opinion, they've rarely done anything deep or interesting with that time period. Until now. The format of the show completely flips as we take on the perspective of the bad guys this episode, with Crosshairs as our protagonist. And while we've had scenes following the Empire's perspective in the previous season, this episode just has so much more purpose and complexity behind it. The absolute clone Chad, Commander Cody returns and joins up with Crosshairs on an infiltration and assassination mission. That alone already makes it the best episode. What makes this episode a masterpiece by Dave Filoni is how it serves as a twisted reflection to classic Clone Wars episodes we've become so accustomed to watching, even down to the clones having to fight reprogrammed battle droids in the episode. But the difference here is that Commander Cody and Crosshairs are being sent to a separatist planet named Desix to rescue an Imperial governor who was already sent there by the Empire for a hostile takeover. So this episode almost acts like one of those classic Clone Wars liberation missions where they go to a planet occupied by the Separatists to free their subjugated people, but instead in this instance they're actually overthrowing a democratically elected government. But we as the audience are conflicted because we're following these characters and almost reluctantly rooting for them as they've always been a symbol of peace and freedom in the galaxy, but in this case they are actually robbing these people of freedom. The dynamic between Crosshairs and Commander Cody is what carries this episode, and the pairing of these two characters was a genius decision by the writing staff. Both clones are eerily similar with their affinity for following orders, Crosshairs having his memorable disposition for good soldiers following orders, and Commander Cody for his iconic betrayal of Obi-Wan Kenobi during the execution of Order 66. Both men still desperately clinging on to this belief in the Empire, even after their most trusted allies have defected from it. Cody still holds on to ideals from a Republic that no longer exists, and Crosshairs does everything to make himself useful for an institution that doesn't care for him. It's actually revealed to us in a conversation with Admiral Rampart that after the events of the season one finale, when Crosshairs declines the chance of joining back with the Bad Batch, that he had to wait 32 days for the Empire to come pick him up, and he still chose to go back. And it was a beautiful narrative and artistic choice to have these two characters reunite for the first time in front of a Clone Wars memorial on Coruscant. Both men appear unrecognizable to each other at first, donning new or modern armor only brought back together by the ghosts of the war that they were born to fight it. That's poetic. We start to see a philosophical difference between Commander Cody and Crosshairs, and this is where their dynamic really begins to brew, as Cody discusses how rumors have it that more and more clones have been questioning the Order. And Crosshairs obviously responds, as you'd expect. Then they are traitors, like the Jedi. The action choreography and pacing in this episode is absolutely brilliant. There was no fluff, everything just had purpose and intention. I think the cinematography was the best that we've seen. The animation between the clones, the droids, the commando droids was sensational. And I think really kind of added to the grit of the battle. There's a scene where droidicas are deployed into battle and you hear the iconic rolling sound effect as they're approaching, but we aren't meant to know where they're coming from. So we have this scene of suspense where the clones are just kind of like looking and we know what's gonna happen when they arrive, but we're just sitting there waiting. 
-hmm. and they approach and they attack, but that was something that they've never done before. It's incredibly creative and I loved it. There's even a scene where Cody and Crossers come across some locals and Cody says, we're here to help. Something we've heard so much across the entirety of the Clone Wars show, but he's met with this look of fear and terror from these people, making him reconsider if that's even true. We reach the climax of this episode when the clones find Governor Groton being held hostage by Tawny Ames. Tawny Ames being the true governor of Desix that rejected Governor Groton's attempts in a, at an Imperial takeover earlier in the episode. As they're in a standoff, Tawny promises that both Governor Groton and the other Imperials being held captive will be released if the Empire recognizes Desix as an independent system and leaves. And after Cody rejects her attempts at negotiating, there is a wonderful exchange between these two characters, where Tawny confronts Cody, saying that the Imperial forces he brought are the only threat to the people of Desix, not her. And as Cody claims that the Empire is seeking peace and prosperity throughout the galaxy, Tawny reveals that she was part of Mina Bonteri's group, if you guys remember from the original Clone Wars series, a group of separatist senators that proposed a treaty during the war to end it peacefully, and says that Chancellor Palpatine rejected it, and at that time she knew that peace was not an option. And in a beautiful moment, Commander Cody removes his helmet, revealing his humanity, and says that peace can be an option this time. As he puts down his weapon, he pleads with Tawny that no more bloodshed needs to occur. Many have died already, and both of them have already survived a war, and be best not to start another one. And when she releases Groton, as expected, he commands them to execute her. When Commander Cody says he promised peace, Groton says, I didn't. And there is a moment where Tawny looks to Commander Cody and says, so much for peace. And while Commander Cody stands defiant to Groton's order, we can all expect what's going to happen next as a blaster goes off, and who else but Crosshair to have fired the shot. And this is why this episode does something that the rest of the show just doesn't, and that how it really explores the political dynamics between what it means to be free and how propaganda and totalitarianism can so quickly cloud that to make soldiers like Commander Cody feel like they're bringing freedom to the galaxy, when in reality, these people were living free. In other instances, it just feels like the Clone Wars and even shows like Rebels, and of course, them being kids shows, they hearken too much on the evil side of things of like these other characters are just so cartoonishly evil when in reality people with good intentions like Commander Cody can find themselves in an institution of oppression. It's something that I think this episode pulls so much from the Andor show and, w and the inner workings of fascism and I, and that's why I was drawn so much to this. And upon their completed mission and Commander Cody and Crosshairs leaving Desix, there's almost a haunting metaphor for the ending of the Clone Wars as these troopers, both Commander Cody and Crosshairs and the clones of their squads that survive, as they are exfiltrating, they see they're being, they are being relieved of their duty by a platoon of stormtroopers, almost to kind of highlight this changing of the guard that is occurring, both physically and spiritually. And the music that's composed for the scene as the stormtroopers are occupying Desix is so incredibly done. It was heavy with synths and strings, very reminiscent of the ending of the Siege of Mandalore arc in the final season of the Clone Wars, you hear this oppressive sound as, as these civilians are rounded up in the squares and you see that freedom has truly died on this planet, that Commander Cody's promise was false. Then comes the best scene in the episode, and maybe the show. The two return back to Coruscant, and as they are approaching the Coruscant barracks, Cody stops once again in front of the Clone Wars memorial. He turns to Crosshairs and asks him if what they're doing is truly making the galaxy better. Crosshairs replies with a very predictable answer. We're soldiers. We do what needs to be done. Cody then goes on to reply with probably one of the most powerful quotes of any of the animated series. You know what makes us different from battle droids? We make our own decisions, our own choices. And we have to live with them too. With that line, as Cody walks off, we are confronted with a painful reminder that despite the clones being programmed by the inhibitor chips to follow Order 66, they still have memories of those decisions and that they have to live with them. And that's why it's so powerful to hear that clones turning away and going AWOL after Order 66. And it, it truly just hammers home the message that they were victims of this war, not soldiers. 
that fought in it. And you can really see that the words that Cody said stick with Crosshairs and give him pause, where he stands alone in front of the memorial and even to him being asleep, eating alone the next day. And he is called back up to Admiral Rampart, congratulating him on the success of his mission. And the next assignment, he is revealed to have a different commander this time. And when Crosshairs asks him, like, what about Cody? And of course, Admiral Rampart doesn't know that that's his name. He only knows him by his CT number, showing that they don't care for the human of these clones, much like the Jedi did, the ones that named them. Admiral Rampart reveals that Commander Cody had gone AWOL after their last discussion, and that just even gives me chills saying. That was such a beautiful and a heartbreaking moment, and you see Crosshairs is heartbroken as he walks off in just utter silence, knowing that another person that he trusted has turned away from something that he must now confront with the reality of. And this just is the perfect way to wrap up such a brilliantly complex and complicated episode. There is so much depth and nuance to just the psyche of our characters and the philosophy of the Clone Wars show as a whole, and that as much as we love the stories of the prequels, the painful reminder of how everyone was exploited and used in in such a in such meaningless ways and how one's humanity can be so quickly discarded. So the, this is the kind of depth that we got from shows like Andor. Um, I love it in this episode. It's something that I want more from this show, and I'm not confident we're going to get it. And I, it's, it's sad. After such a brilliant episode and such a positive review, it's hard for me to pretend to be enthusiastic about going back to the, the good old squad next week um, because we just don't get this level of depth and uh, character development. And I think currently Crosshairs is the most interesting character because of his disposition. Not so much last season, but even just one episode alone, just seeing the turmoil that's going on within him, it, it makes me excited to see more of him. And I really do hope that he makes the right decision eventually. So I guess that's something I can look forward to for this season. But what are your guys' thoughts? Did you like this episode? How great was it to see Commander Cody again? Um, I had some questions throughout the episode labeled down below, and I, I hope you guys comment down there. I'd love to have more discussions with you guys going forward on these videos instead of me just talking to you guys. I hope you're enjoying the content, of course, but regardless, um, I'm Matt, part of the Circle Club. We drop content every single week. Tyrone has posted a new video about the most anticipated 2023 movies, and you should totally check that out. We obviously have award season coming up. There's a lot to cover here and a lot of exciting stuff. So, as always, may the Force be with you, and just be you. Take care, everyone.